So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Angela Roll. I'm the director here at the Cultural Center. And uh, this is a conversation that we've been having with community folks as well as the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute. Um, and then we have other partners, the English department, um, the Thomas J. Dodd Center as well. And so uh, when we often think of undocumented folks, we think primarily about the Latinx community. And we forget that there are other people from other areas of the world that also face the same issue. And certainly the issue that we're talking about today is a gentleman from Indonesia uh, who has faced the same um, challenges that many of our Latinx undocumented folks are facing, particularly our students. Uh, if you've been following the Hartford Current and the news recently, there was also a Chinese gentleman this week um, with the help of Governor Malloy who had his deportation stayed. Um, and that was really uh, something that was done frantically over the phone with ICE and meeting with people in the Hartford area. And we were very successful in making sure that gentleman remained here in the state. So Olive Bach, who is also an alum from UConn, um, he was a student of Dr. Schlon Biles. Um, he's been working in the community. He was formerly the, the legislative analyst for the Asian Pacific American Affairs Commission, which is now part of the Commission on Equity and Opportunity. And he has gone off um, and doing wonderful work in the community and brought us uh, the information about Sujit Nu and how we could, as academics, as students, as a larger community uh, here at the university could be helpful. So I'm gonna turn it over to you all and turn it over to you, Kathy, to talk more broadly about undocumented folks within the Asian Pacific American community here. Um, not only in the state of Connecticut, but certainly nationwide. So, turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> so, I'm just going to just hang out behind that screen and, <laughs> and do something, do his thing. Okay, so hi. Um, thank you so much for coming out, um, especially on a Friday at 3 p.m. Um, as Angela indicated, I'm Kathy Schlein Biles. I direct the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute. And I also teach courses in Asian American studies. Um, and this is, a, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. So I'm a Cambodian American. And um, during, like soon after 9-11, you started seeing a lot of deportation plans for Cambodians who had actually committed crimes. Uh, years prior had served the time, but then they were now being faced with deportation as per uh, kind of a 9-11 initiative. And I'm not going to delve too deeply into that, but I've actually talked to a lot of individuals who were heads of households who faced deportation. They, were at, they actually came to the United States as refugees, as children. They didn't speak the language, didn't know the culture, and they were basically sent back to a country with no guarantee of human rights uh, protection, et cetera, right? So um, when we think about, uh, go to what Angela said, when we think about undocumented individuals, we oftentimes turn to Latinx communities, but I'm just gonna throw down, to use like a 90s term, drop some science in terms of like uh, statistics and just give a brief history. And then I'll turn it over to a low who will uh, speak more um, directly about Sahidno's case. So, um, and I'm, I normally would do a full slideshow, but because we, um, because I'm computer challenged, and I have to keep Gwen Matoma's um, Zoom account up, I'm just gonna go this way, all right? So I know that, like, I want you to imagine this as the most glorious uh, Time Magazine image. Um, it says, those Asian American whiz kids, and I'm just gonna uh, describe it, We've got a, a girl here with a computer. We have a guy with a backpack here. Um, this dates me, but how many of you ever watched the show Heroes? This is Hero? Okay, so these are all actors, <coughs> not even Asian American whiz kids, right? So they're models. Um, we have a guy back here who's like a junior Jeremy Lin with his basketball. We've got someone here um, who has his books and then another woman, a uh, girl carrying books. And then just someone who's happy to be sitting behind someone with a 
here. Um, and so the, those Asian American whiz kids, like this is actually what comes to mind when we think about Asian Americans in the United States as model minorities, right? You know, it's this idea that it doesn't matter how long they've been in the country, within, you know, uh, a week they will become the valedictorian, they will learn the violin, etc. right? We've all heard this model minoritization of Asian Americans, right? Um, and there are some reasons behind that, which uh, we can talk about in the Q&A, but I want to really highlight how that particular myth, which seems very positive, actually leads to profound invisibility, right? And I will speak quite directly. I was not a model minority. I can barely play an instrument, and I almost got kicked out of my prom for smoking, and almost didn't graduate. So go, engineer. <laughs> All right. Um, but, um, it's important to note that Asians, unlike any other immigrant uh, group, were uh, specifically targeted by immigration legislation for roughly 100 years, okay? So I always ask this, there are a lot of Asians in the world, right? Um, but in terms of percentage in the United States, Asian Americans constitute roughly about 6 to 7% of the population, and the question is why? And the answer is that it wasn't really until 1965 that uh, Asian immigrants could gain in mass entrance to the United States. And I'll go quickly through the, uh, the restrictions. But um, how many of you have parents who were born in another country in the room? How many of you, so like of your parents, how many of your parents are engineers, doctors, or part of a professional ca ca uh, class, right? You know, okay. So those of you who raised your hands, if you're Asian American, odds are that your family kind of came over as a result of either the 1965 Immigration Act, which freed up any racial requirement for immigration, or you came as a refugee as a result of the 1975 and 1980 Refugee Acts, okay? So for Asian Americans, like the reason why we are here is largely because of the Hard Seller Act. And there were seven preferences, and this is going to sound very familiar given what the Trump administration is putting forth, this idea of meritocracy. But there was an emphasis on professional classes, like engineers, right? People who are really good in the sciences, and this was because of the Cold War, right? We need scientists to really kind of help us, you know, win against the Soviet Union. So you've got those individuals. Then you have family unification. So there is a direct correlation as we fight more and more wars in Asia. Servicemen are having relationships with women over there, and then they're starting families, right? So you have to find a way to bring them over here, right? There's also this emphasis on family unification, which has been uh, couched as chain migration, right? But imagine, like, you know, you're the first generation. You come here, and you have maybe a sister who is in India and you want to bring that sister to the United States. This act allows that, okay? Um, and there's, um, you know, immigrants of exceptional ability. So if you are a top um, author, right, if you're an artist, you would gain access to the United States, right? And, and there was an incentive because if you're from a communist country, if you can actually provide immigration status to those individuals, that kind of shows the United States is, you know, like a much more tolerant place. Okay, you follow me? So this is all in line with like what's happening during the 60s in terms of the civil rights movement. And to give a context prior to 1965, I always have the fear my flies down, but it's not awesome. <laughs> all right, so prior to 1965, um, the every country had a set number of immigrants they could send legally. After 1965, the world was divided into two hemispheres. The Eastern Hemisphere could send 170,000 individuals legally. The Western Hemisphere, 120,000. The takeaway is that now, because of this act, we have 52 million immigrants who came legally to the United States. And this is one of the reasons why Asian immigrants are the fastest growing population, right? So, um, and I know that this might uh, resonate for some of you as well, like during the late 90s and early 2000s, the United States began an H1B1 uh, visa program to bring individuals who had expertise in computer programming to the United States. So, if you're Indian American, this might be something that resonates, maybe your father was brought over, um, and these are contract high-skilled laborers, quote unquote, but they're brought in as well. And the reason why it's the late 90s is that I know that this dates us, but how many of you remember Y2K? 
Okay, a couple of people, right? My husband is one of them. Right? You know, so, but why do you So it's hard to believe that there was this huge anxiety that all of the computers had been set to like 1999. They could not turn to 2000. So it wasn't clear if shit was going to blow up like the Godfather and we would have no electricity. So people were actually brought in to actually work on the Y2K problem, but then also think of the rise of the like kind of the um, online industries and also the tech sector. Okay, um, and the reason why we have the sense that Asian Americans are the happiest minority group is partially because of the model minority myth. But also, think about it, if you're targeting professional classes, those individuals likely have more money than, say, refugees coming to the United States. You follow me, right? So when Trump is talking about a meritocracy, this is actually a re-articulation of a policy that's already in place, okay? So um, let's kind of talk about like why Asians are, you know, and this is uh, how not to do a slide. I've chosen something you can't see. It says a history of illegality. So when we think of illegal immigrants or undocumented immigrants, we actually have to think about the Chinese, right? Um, and um, it's because from 1882 to 1943, Chinese immigration was prohibited to the United States. And the prohibition occurred because there was an anxiety over the Chinese taking jobs, etc. right? That's an oversimplification. But as the Chinese were impacted, then other Asian groups were impacted as well. So in 1906, Japanese immigrants are targeted. In 1917, it's the entirety of the Eastern Hemisphere, including South Asians. In 1924, not only were Asians targeted, but also individuals escaping um, Nazi-occupied Europe. So in 1924, if you were trying to come into the country, the United States as a refugee, like during World War II, you could not gain admittance because it was a violation of that act. And this is credited for you know, being partially responsible for the high death rates during the Holocaust. Um, and then we have the 1943 Chinese exclusion repeal. And lest you think that people got less racist in 1943, it's just important to know that China was a major ally. Okay? So um, I just highlight this uh, because this, um, this issue of illegality kind of placed Chinese immigrants as undocumented before we even had the language to talk about undocumented, right? But when we think about the issue now, that's completely absented. So I'm going to bring this to um, a close with some random images. How many of you know what this is? I, it's I, I don't know. If I don't know if it's the same food as in Indonesia, but it's like like stir fried noodles. Yeah, pad thai. How many of you have had pad thai? How many of you have been to a Thai restaurant in your life, or you've been uh, you've heard of one? Okay. And this is an end of, and these are transracial Korean adoptees. So why did I put up this image? So Mark Padimpad has a great book called Flavors of Empire. But part of the reason why you see the rise of Thai restaurants in the 70s and 80s is because Thai students who were on visas during the Cold War had their visas revoked in the early 1970s as the Vietnam War came to a close. There were a lot of military bases in Thailand, and part of the agreement was to give visas to Thai students. So Thai students were actually stuck in the United States. They could not attend school, so what they started doing was actually making Thai food and opening Thai restaurants, right? So, and, and we never think about kind of the restaurant industry in terms of, in, uh, like, illegality or undocumented workers, but if you go into a Chinese restaurant, odds are you're going to encounter people who are undocumented, all right? So I just kind of raise that point. This is, I think, going to resonate for Sahitna because he, too, was a student. And then um, for transracial adoptees, this is a huge issue, like, so uh, there was a very um, like high profile case involving a Korean American adoptee who was facing deportation. His family never got him naturalized citizenship. So he actually got deported to a country, again, that he had no um, cultural connection to, could not speak the language, and it's because, again, he assumed if I'm adopted, I'm already naturalized, and that's not the case, right? You'll see this time and again that people think that they are citizens because they come to the United States maybe as refugees, but you have to go through a naturalization process. And I just want to put out, how much do you think it costs to go through that process? Just a guess. Yeah, I mean, it looks like 
sharing less than 1,000. It's a lot more. So it's usually about 10 to 20,000 to go through the entire process, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, mean, I don't know because for me, I don't know. I asked my mom because I yeah. uh, just got my membership. Uh -huh. So like, I don't know what my mom said. Maybe it's just for that little part. It's like that less than 1,000. Yeah, but it's like the entire process is exactly. But if you even think about it, like if you're a refugee, that's still like a hunk of change. That's a lot of money to me. But I, I think a dollar is a lot of money, right? So, but what I'm saying is that it's very expensive. So a lot of people just don't go through the process, right? So as a final point, I just want to kind of highlight what's happened most recently. So um, these are some statistics that I think will, um, you know, kind of challenge what we think about in terms of undocumented individuals. So there are roughly 1.3 million, see I didn't even put the million here, it's not 1.3 undocumented Asian Americans. <laughs> that would be a stunningly small number. <laughs> 1.3 million undocumented Asian American uh, immigrants in the United States and roughly 40,000 are children, okay? Um, and during the Obama administration alone, 250,000 Asian uh, immigrants were deported, right? That's pretty stunning. Right? And if we think about the Obama administration and compared to the Trump administration, this is just like now going on steroids, right? Um, and if you're interested in kind of reading more about what's happening on the East Coast, and I think that Alok will really highlight this by way of a personal narrative, I would encourage you to go to uh, the RAVES website. It's revolutionizing Asian American immigrant stories on the East Coast, and you'll actually read firsthand accounts of individuals who are undocumented who are part of the Asian Pacific Islander community. Right? So that's the larger context, and now I'm going to turn it to my esteemed colleague. Hi, everyone. Well, really appreciate y'all coming out um, on, a, on a great Friday. Um, and sweet so you know, we're going to have call in for in a little bit. I would definitely appreciate seeing all y'all here. I'm um, interested in kind of hearing about um, how the circumstances, like on the systemic level, and also um, how he had to I'm kind of unfortunately become a victim to a system that's half the highlighted or pretty much based on like racism, xenophobia. Um, in his case, um, Islamophobia plays um, a pretty critical role into why he essentially had to incarcerate himself in, uh, in a church. Um, so uh, just a little about how I kind of um, ended up with some people. You know, um, so again, my name is Alok. Uh, I'm an organizer in a grassroots coalition called the Connecticut Immigrant Rights Alliance. Um, and although our member groups focus on like different issues involving advancing rights for immigrants and people of color, like I'm sure many of y'all heard of C4D that, um, that advocates to open up um, access to higher education for undocumented students. Um, as a coalition, primarily what we work on is immigration enforcement on the state and local level. Um, so typically what that looks like is how state and local police, courthouses, or any other state and local like government entities are co uh, collaborating or colluding are communicating with state and local, with um, federal immigration authorities like ICE to um, access and attack our um, our community members. And so, um, for Suhid so himself, um, himself um, actually a really really prominent educator, scholar, activist um, in the Greater Hartford area in particular, I met um, while I was working at the Asian uh, Pacific American uh, Commission um, on which Angel um, and Angel was on the board, and I met him at a few of our events at the Capitol because he's a really strong advocate for, um, for advancing the rights of people of color, particularly when it comes to access to health um, education. And so we built a pretty good relationship over the past uh, few years, just kind of like casual, cordial, but very friendly. Um, just good to see another kind of a familiar face um, in some of the same circles that we run in. Um, and it's not until last summer when I was called on to come to an accompaniment. Accompaniment is when, um, um, it's kind of like it's kind of like probation or parole like for undocumented folks. So for a, for a lot of undocumented community members, they're on ICE's radar in that they actually check in with ICE um, either once a year or a few times a year um, just to present that, you know, there haven't been any material changes in the circumstances, like they haven't had any run-ins with the law or, you know, there haven't been anything, any extenuating circumstances or any situations that might make them targets for removal. Um, removal, which is kind of like fundamentally bullshit anyway, but we don't have to um, delve into too much of that uh, at, at the moment. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of, and so for folks that have to 
check in with ICE. It's kind of it's kind of it's kind of like that. And lately, what's been happening and what happened to Subhitno is that for undocumented folks who've been getting stays of removal, um, have been getting those stays denied, right? So meaning that they've been living, they've been checking in with ICE. You know, no no change in their circumstances or their lifestyle or anything. Nothing to merit any kind of like punishment or like visit any punishment upon them. But lately, uh, particularly under the current administration, um, a lot of people who've been, who've been for years and decades even receiving those stays have been getting those stays denied. So as Angela mentioned, there was an ethnically Korean um, Chinese couple uh, out of, I think, the Farmington Valley area uh, who got there, who, was, who were victims of kind of like this, like prosecutorial like indiscretion, basically individual ICE officers saying, okay. and basically ripping people away. Um, that's simple, right? They're doing it behind the desk. There's no interview. There's no nothing. They just check a form. No, stay denied. Like regardless, um, and people's lives get torn apart just like that. Um, so for for Suhitno in particular, just to kind of give you an idea of um, a little background of, of his story, how he came to be, and how he got to where he is um, right now, where he doesn't have to be. Um, so he actually first came to the United States, um, and also just to give you an idea of just how I learned um, he is, he came to the United States on a Fulbright scholarship, which is a very prestigious international scholarship, um, to Columbia University um, on to, to study, I think it was on um, anthropology, it was for a master's program in anthropology. Um, he completed that program and then went back to Indonesia, and then he comes back to the U.S. in 1989, um, and Sometime in late 89 to the early 90s, he transfers to, of all places, UConn. Um, so at this point, Suhitno is enrolled in the early 90s, like 91 to 93, in a medical anthropology um, doctoral program at the University of Connecticut. Um, and as grateful as he was for kind of the educational opportunity he had here, this is also kind of the beginning of his problems with the immigration system. Um, so the student visa that he came on to complete his doctoral program wasn't based on any kind of time limit. It was just based on him completing his coursework. And the way all visas work, so there's not really any path to any kind of other status or relief once you complete a visa. The way like 99% of visas work is you come, you do whatever you need to do, whatever you need is for, then you go back home. Um, for him, he never, for Suki, no, he never got a chance to complete um, the the objective of his visa, his student visa, because although he completed his coursework, there were some administrative errors in the, um, at UConn, and I'm sure many of y'all are familiar with administrative errors in the university system, but um, for him, it kind of had some some pretty pretty grave consequences, because uh, although he completed his coursework, for if you're completing a doctoral program, you need to have a basic an academic advisor kind of guide you through um, your, your continued work after you're done with your coursework. And for Subitno, his advisor kind of just dipped. Um, no one really knows what happened. I think he, he, I think he moved to another country or something, but basically this advisor kind of disappeared and he was arguing with the university to provide him with a new advisor, which wouldn't be, I don't imagine it's that hard. I'm not aware of the logistics or procedure, but I imagine it's not too difficult just to assign him another uh, advisor within that same department. Um, and they refused to do it. Um, they refused to do it, and because he never, because like a like unreasonable amount of time had lapsed since his, he began his visa and um, he wasn't able to complete it, he lost his student visa. So he lost his student visa, which also meant he lost his status in the U.S. So from that point on, he was he was undocumented. Um, and just kind of like a side note, that's how a lot of um, well, that's how a lot of our Asian students are both become undocumented is they overstay. Uh, because they overstay a visa because there isn't exactly a very accessible land border. Um, but, so yeah, he, he, he lost his visa and he, he was undocumented since then. And being undocumented, that makes it really difficult for him to find work, um, makes it difficult for him to well, continue his studies. And so for a really long time, uh, so even though and his wife have been kind of getting by just doing small jobs, and they've been really, really um, involved in their community. They're both really devout uh, practicing Muslims, um, which would also kind of begin another chapter of Sweet Noah's problem, not for any fault of his own, though. 
Um, and so they started uh, teaching that they started teaching chronic studies classes in the community. They got involved with a number of uh, mosques in the greater Hartford area, and kind of became over the years really cherished, really well known, and really um, beloved members of the community. Um, Tuitho himself is a, is a youth mentor, um, not in any official capacity, but just local youth from mosques in his neighborhood. Um, he's one of those just those older folks that they, that they came to for guidance, especially if they didn't necessarily have that kind of guidance in their household. He's just one of those figures that people knew who they go to and trust. Um, and all just to say, like you know, all of this, um, and despite just how kind of really important he is to, to his community, and just how much of a vital figure he's been. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, it really has no matter. And that really also comes to say just um, kind of how arbitrary and prejudicial and racist and like bullshit the entire removal and deportation system is. I mean, in conjunction with our like criminal injustice system and all that. And you know, we can't um, we can't pretend like we can we can um, detach those from each other either. Um, so what got so he's no into. Um, into some deep, uh, deeper consequences was um, post 9-11. So post 9-11, there's this pretty significant sea change in the way that Im immigration is administered in the federal government. 9-11 um, uh, kind of marks the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, um, which is the umbrella organization of groups like Customs and Border Patrol, ICE, uh, basically immigration enforcement. Whereas previously, those were, I think, under the Department of, of of justice was more administered in the Department of Justice and a separate um, immigration um, bureau. But after 9 11, we kind of see a shift into um, where, enforced, where immigration, um, the language of immigration is very much um, tethered to the language of enforcement. And so, um, and so Islamophobia, Islamophobia post 9 11 is not a strange concept to anyone, um, not on the social level and not on the policy level either. So what happened post 9-11, how Suhino kind of got caught up in that deportation dragnet, despite him kind of living undocumented and peaceably for a number of years before he even got into any kind of issues, was um, the federal government enacted what's called the Special Registration Program for a really brief period of time. So it was like a few months between 2002 and 2003. And the Special Registration Program was designed to entice um, males, in particular, from Muslim-majority countries to register with the federal government. Um, and a lot of the people that signed up to the federal government um, were did so under the impression and were enticed by the prospect of being able to get some kind of papers or get some kind of status. Um, so for so he, no, I don't know, he, he says his own attorney kind of suggested to him, you know, instead of, like, Instead of continuing to be undocumented and kind of um, not being able to access, you know, proper employment or anything like that, why don't you fed register with the federal government? And so he did. Um, so for those who don't know, the fe uh, ICE has its headquarters in, in Hartford. It's on Main Street, Hartford. It's a federal building where um, a federal district court is also housed. So he went to the ICE office in the fifth floor of that building and registered under the special registration program. As a male from a Muslim majority country, as a male immigrant from a Muslim majority country, um, and instead of being given any kind of information as to how we can uh, get any kind of status or any kind of uh, special relief, um, he was given a notice to appear. He was given a court date for immigration court. So it's a trap, right? Um, so that, so after that. Um, ended up going through his court proceedings. Um, like so many folks, he ended up with a really, really poor lawyer and poor legal representation. We didn't really give him much guidance or really any assistance. Um, and so he took what's called um, a voluntary departure. And that's not voluntary, right? Because no really removal is really voluntary. It's basically ICE saying, why don't you leave yourself so we don't have to spend the money to deport you. Um, and so one, what's, uh, what's supposed to be a benefit of that is when you do go back to your mother country, regardless of if you still consider it that or not, um, typically there's like a 10 year bar. So if you're deported from the United States, you can't even attempt to come back within 10 years without facing some really severe additional consequences other than um, re-entry itself already being a felony. 
Um, so he took the but so he took Vontae departure, but he didn't leave because he spent he gave his best life he gave the best years of his life to Connecticut. This is where he started to establish his home and his community. This is where he started to really become who he is was here in Connecticut. Um, so he didn't leave, and so sometime in 2011, not too many years ago, um, ICE raided him at his house. Um, he's got a little small apartment in West Hartford. Um, two agents came in the middle of the day in, the, in front of all of his neighbors and anything. Remind you, um, the man is now uh, 70 years old, so he was still, he wasn't very young when this happened either. Um, and he's a very frail man, as you'll see when he comes up on, on the video. And they snatched him. They snatched him, they took him, and they drove him to, they drove him to um, Massachusetts where he was locked up in immigration detention for two months. So two months, it's like 65 year old man, um, just very, just very peaceful member of his community, very, very cherished person in his community, just snatched up just like that, off of nothing. Um, and so there was some community support. So because he, he, he was so, he's kind of so like well known and like cherished in the community, um, folks in the community started like a campaign to, to get him out, um, and it worked. Um, it, it worked. Uh, they started public campaigns and rallying around around him and his story and his cause. And ICE released him from detention and started giving him that stage of removal that I mentioned before, which again is kind of like probation. Like ICE, like ICE knows you're in the country and documented, but as long as you're checking in with them and they feel like there's no need to like make you a priority for removal, um, you know they'll they'll allow you to stay um, under. They'll allow you to remain um, in the United States. You're still undocumented, but you're under a federal supervision. Um, and so he was getting those days of removal um, for years, for, that was 2012, so about five years. Um, and then last summer, um, I didn't even know Sudeikno had an immigration case until I was asked to go to a company and it was his. I was like, oh shit, it's you. I didn't know you had a case. Um, and we started talking, going through a little bit of the history. And I figured, all right, well, I mean, I mean, as long as there, your circumstances haven't changed, you should be good. Um, we went, we went up to the ICE office, and um, they denied a stay. Um, point blank, just behind the desk, no, no message, no explanation, no nothing. Just gave him a paper, said your stay has been denied. Um, that same day, um, just moments after they denied the stay, um, they took Sugitno to a place called ISAC, which is right around the corner from the federal building. ISAP is a private contractor that makes electronic GPS uh, bracelets. So at 69 years old, incarcerated in a church, he still got the GPS angle bracelet on. Like like a like like a like an animal to the, that they're tracking. Um, and so they took him around the corner, slapped the bracelet on him, um, and told him to buy a ticket back to Indonesia. They told him come back in a month and show us your itinerary. Um, so we weren't going to have that. So we started, we started, well, we kind of brought back like the public campaign and building off the momentum of a lot of the other cases and a lot of the other activism that was happening around the state. A lot of other individuals and families going through it. Um, but it, 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 like ICE was not budging. And I think particularly under this new administration, not to say that it's the um, alpha and omega of violence against immigrants and people of color, but just how much more difficult things have gotten particularly for, for undocumented folks on this administration. Um, they took them, they put the GPS bracelet on him, and they weren't budging. Um, they kept denying any other application for a stay. And so finally, uh, the day before Suikna was supposed to um, meet ICE agents at JFK to fly back to Indonesia, um, he decided he wanted to take a sanctuary. So are, are folks familiar with the concept of sanctuary? Yeah, there's been a few folks that we coordinated their sanctuary. So, so even though it's the latest case of an individual um, who, who, who had to take sanctuary, um, basically to fight for his right to remain home. And so, just to bring out the speed, for the past you know 120 plus days, we even have been self-incarcerated at a Unitarian Universalist Church um, in Meriden. Um, late night, October 9th, I got him and his wife, and we drove him to the church, and we settled them there. And that's kind of where, they, where they've been since then, while his lawyers are trying to figure out a way to get some kind of um, legal relief. 
Um, and he, he's got he's got like a good amount of like support. The church uh, members of the congregation mobilize like a support team really quickly. Um, I myself kind of handle like the activist advocacy side um, and helping his legal team with some of the legal work as well. Um, and he like like Luis Chavarria, Michael Reyes, Nelson Pino, who's currently in sanctuary. Um, just names of individuals who had to kind of take this really extreme measure um, just to just to remain home with, well, with their families, and and um, and we don't and we also don't want to we also want to avoid like this good versus bad immigrant rhetoric, right? Like people with criminal records deserve less support. Like we really want to uh, just just because like fundamental flaws and notions of criminality in the system itself, we really don't want to elevate those um, you know those concepts and those ideas. But just to give you an idea of just how indiscriminate, just how violent, just how widespread these attacks on the community are, I mean, the man is this kind of situation. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at as far as um, this story. And um, maybe we can try to get him up on our He's already there. He's waiting for us. Oh, he is? Yeah, he's been there for a while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
I came to the United States before in October uh, 1981. And 1984, uh, March 1984, I come back to Indonesia this, uh, under full scholarship. And then got to England in 1989 uh, for my doctorate uh, by USID. This is uh, quite a little strange in my case. And uh, I was going on uh, when I back from Michigan and I would say my professor, my advice told me, okay, forget about Michigan, just focus in Yukon. But in Yukon, I know what's going on because my uh, funding agency, Lucia, is the intermediary of funding agency that let me uh, switch school again. This was the one time, which is the rule. And I know what's going on and then my advice left without saying anything and make me from go back and forth when he left and nobody replaced him in take years and come to special registration in 2003. I cannot go to anything. Unfortunately, I came there without my lawyer. This is uh, after the license cost problem for myself. This is uh, and uh, this uh, special reason that happened to Muslim country, even that Muslim country, it doesn't mean that uh, for Muslim, uh, even non Muslim affected to in a country. It is including before only several countries like uh, probably Pakistan included, and the other country also Afghanistan, and including Indonesia later on, one month later. And this is uh, uh, so, uh, in 1983, in, in, in 2003, uh, at the time, I came without my lawyer, I was my lawyer late, and uh, my friend told me, okay, put the passport, and then I put it inside, and it took like, make uh, everything screw up, uh, and it took even my lawyer to upset because he wanted to take the, she wanted to take the form, the green form. And at that time, I already came inside, inside and I think my passport is difficult here. And they are playing with my my passport. This is the story. And finally, going on, going on. And until in 2011, uh, uh, they, they said they are looking for me. And uh, I never moved. And then finally, happened uh, in December 10, 2011, that uh, the ice grab, ice people grabbed me and stayed there about 65 days, uh, 67 days. And then I thought after I came out, nothing happened. Still, something, I don't know what happened. It looked like somebody either following me or following my wife. And until 2016, I think in 2016, something so strange, my internet gone when I came to the Britain Public Library uh, before the election of the 4th, uh, uh, November 4th. And then in December, on uh, December 24th, 2016, come out again. This is the very strange thing in my case. Uh, I think this is the brief thing that I can tell you. And uh, we can talk later. Okay.
and but unfortunately I'll have to leave the United States after I graduate. So uh, um, I was I've been meaning to ask you a question about about Indonesia in particular because because my parents told me about what it was like being Chinese Indonesian during the 90s and it was very difficult for 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 people of that background to find jobs unless you had connections with the with the Suharto government and um, I've been meaning to ask you about uh, what it's like what's it what's the um, what career opportunities are, are like today and how finding a job in the Indonesia is different than than what it was mm -hmm. like in the in the eighties, nineties. Yeah. Uh in my point of view because uh, you still young, right? <laughs> like me or they who they all and I don't know in Indonesia there's a certain limit of people who is under uh, above uh, sixty something uh, it's already quite less likely you know get something but whatever education is just worth it you know the worst I know uh, even something happened in my case at the time because uh, my point of view at the time I want to get the differences between uh, because it is is my job at the time but uh, quantitative and quantitative method and based on my uh, background in uh, public health before and also in uh, mixed with anthropology and I want to see what is the similar the differences. It's fortunate I get the new one, you know. Um, it's quite lucky I get that and it's not from the professor but from the book but I get from the book that you know, I read it. After all these things I get it. What, 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 what I need, you know? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if, uh, another question I wanted to ask you is, is it important to, do you have to be, is it, is, is being related to someone with influence more, more, uh, more um, important than, I mean, I mean, less important than it was back then? Or is it the same level? Mm -hmm. It's not clear what is that. Is uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, is is having connections with uh, with those in power the still as important as it was back then for finding opportunities? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, but you have to try to to get uh, to stay here because of course you cannot give up. Don't you give up what you want? If you really want, you will get it. But you will be honest, not cool, that my message is the only way, because, uh, yeah, I don't know what is happening in the Quran, is, uh, I'm a Muslim, but it's applied to everywhere, anywhere, so far as I know, yeah, because in the Quran, it's been told that something that, you know, uh, not only just about the unseen God, but it's telling also the unseen uh, part of the human being, you know. Because we can not find it, what is in the human being part, yeah. And also, we can see from the pattern of action, right? But when we take action, we have to be careful too, because it can affect the reputation. Yeah, this is that, uh, this in the Quran has been tell so that, you know, yeah, uh, be careful with your mouth, and be careful with your uh, action, because God gave you the Knowledge is not worth having people to help other people. God will give you reward. But if you do that, then God will punish you to be the lowest in the lowest. That is the reality, you know. In life, yeah, okay, don't talk about God. Talk about this is the real life. If you do bad, you don't need to wait until you die. Mostly people get the same thing. They get the same thing, punishment at the same time. The boy can you know, at this time. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, just uh, when you have the, when you have the intention to, to, to get into it. Uh, I know prayer is important, but take action. Either you talk, either you take action, uh, talk to people, take action by yourself. It will stop you in doing something. You use your pen, your brain. You know, this, uh, that God will never stop you. Because God, there is a will, or there is a way. Right? Thank you so much, Fox and Gina. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Actually, a
could we, because we are getting towards the end, I'm wondering, can we ask him what he needs? Would that be, like, in terms of, like, what he needs because he is in sanctuary? Would you mind asking, does he need anything? Oh, can we oh. take one more question? Yeah, we can take one more question. Yeah, there's one more question. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we'll take the one question and then we'll just kind of can ask him about that. Yeah. yeah. Hello, hello. Hello. So it seems like uh, a lot of the problems started after you got on that registry. So I wanted to ask, um, how do you think, I guess, your life would be playing out if you did uh, hop on that registry? And you mean about the, yeah, what, what you call policy in such a country that, uh, what you call, you can see immigration, uh, from long times, very slow change, right? Yes. And even in the demography, you, uh, from, you can see from the point of view, what you call, uh, all still change, but policy is still the same, so far as I know, because people who work there are still the same. But people who work must get this, the, the right input, the right uh, fit, whatever feedback that has been given, you know? And this is why, uh, like, my fear is in a policy like analysis, meaning, you know, when something wrong in the, in the field, I talk uh, right away. I give the note, and it's your to like this, this is wrong. Yeah. But even we're seeing the top level, or just people in the top level just fine. And the critical point is people in the middle. People in the middle is to give feedback to the top level, you know. And people in the immigrants just grab it, and they don't know what anything, what, 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 what the hell they are doing. But so if the impact is still in the top level, this must give the right people, whoever, whether they pro or against with the entire immigration. Right? Okay. So the people in the middle need, are you saying the people in the middle? I know, because uh, what I see when people lying is lying, uh, you know, like I saw that I saw lying, is I told you. Uh, it's something that's not really, really true. Okay. Yeah. They have to tell the truth. It's not like that. Because mm -hmm. mess up all the what happened in the, in the top level. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Alok, would you mind asking the question about, I don't want to put you on the spot, but Alok, would you mind asking what he needs, like what's in the place? Yeah. Um, please no. So, um, um, the students and staff out here are, you know, really concerned about, like, your well-being and just, like, how you're doing in the church, and so they just want to know if there's anything in particular that you need or that you like. Um, now to, to, to bring to you or anything? Uh, whatever, you know, that, uh, for me, uh, uh, what do you call? Just praying is the most important to pray for me <laughs> and to work hard in my, 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 what, my message, to tell the truth, because it's important to tell the truth anywhere, so it will come out, right? Sooner or later, I know that uh, what you call American dream for me is already far away, but who knows that I can reach it, right? Yeah, but as long as you still alive, still can breathe, yeah, this, this you still have, you know, uh, even you sick, if you still can walk, then you're still healthy. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, uh, so uh, that's the end end of our program. We folks just wanna like wave goodbye. Uh, all right. Yeah, if there is anybody, I know that something that uh for certain certain people is completely wrong. Is you know that yeah, if they want to stop from the beginning, not like this. It's already. Even in 2001, it's already difficult, and uh, why still people coming in and they, they come? If you want to have to, have to be consequent with that part. Yeah, if they want to put the 10 year bar, it's to be the 10 year bar. Okay, people who come before 2011, uh, 2001, can get green card right away. You can get green card right away, right? And come 2011, they can get a work permit, they can go home and come back again. And from 2011 until this time, 2013, whatever, you know, that they can never permit cannot go home. Yeah. It's the fair thing, I think. That, that, that's like, it's not clear. People can go up. Uh, yeah. It's not special thing that people who is not, yeah, uh, probably getting married, whatever, you know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
this week, no, so uh, a few of us will see you at 6 o'clock at the church, and we're ending the program here. So you can watch yeah, it. no problem. Okay. okay. Bye. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> like their stories that was really kind of the point of the program because when we think about undocumented individuals it's always a mass etc but again sharing those stories and kind of getting a bit more education as to like what exactly it entails to go through an immigration process like this and like the carceral dimensions of it is really important um, to that end we do actually have something that you can it won't take much time um, but we do have just um, pre-printed, uh, Kathleen Wright, like pre-printed letters that we can send to our state reps if you want to just kind of sign um, that, just, you know, so that you have something to take away so that you are helping um, to hit no in his state, but also for other people as well. So um, I know it's kind of awkward. I'm going to just leave these here. You can pick them up and fill them out, and then we'll, we'll, collect, them. Yeah. we'll collect them. Um, so but a model, a model letter, actually. A model letter. So you can always write your own. Um, but just, it's awkward, but I love hearing applause for myself and for a loaf. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, so. Yeah.